three. Good evening and welcome to the June 6th uh, meeting of the Victoria City Council. Ms. Hilbrick, would you please call roll? Yes, sir. Councilwoman Solis? Here. Councilman Crocker? Here. Councilwoman Scott? Here. Councilman Lofgren? Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Young? Here. Okay. Mayor Bok Knight and Councilman Della Garza will not be joining us this evening. At this time, I would invite you all to please stand with the pledges and remain standing for a brief moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas flag. Thank you. All right, it looks like we all need a refresher on the Texas Pledge, or some of us do. <laughs> um, I have to say, since the mayor always blocks my view, I had to learn it. <laughs> so I've got it. <laughs> well, he sometimes starts with a prayer. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, good evening, Mr. Mr. Garza. How are you? <laughs> Great. Good afternoon, good. Mayor. We're in a, we're mayor a jovial Pro mood. Mayor uh, Pro I'm so used to just saying mayor, you know, I was, always, I know. Uh, I was yeah. already going to promote you. It's the you. B team, I understand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you have any announcements or reminders at this time? I, I sure do. Uh, on behalf of the entire city, we want to remind the public that all non-emergency offices will be closed on Monday, June 19th in observance of Juneteenth. That is now a recognized federal holiday. Um, offices will reopen at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, June 20th. All garbage, recycling, and yard waste will be collected as normal. The library will be open on that day, but it will close early at 5 p.m. On behalf of HR, but really everybody, uh, the City of Victoria will host a job fair on Wednesday, June 28th at the Community Center Annex from 7.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. The free public event will offer on-the-spot interviews and job offers to qualified candidates. To find out more or apply for available openings, please visit victoriatx.gov. And obviously, uh, if you're listening and you know somebody, send them our way. We could use their help. Uh, on behalf of CBB, Explore Victoria, Texas is sponsoring a free ticket night for Dad's Day at the park with the Victoria Generals on Father's Day, Sunday, June 18th. Gates open at 6 p.m. And Dad can play catch. Our uh, dads can play catch. There's not just going to be one dad. Plural dad. <coughs> dads can play catch with the kids on the field at 6.30 p.m. prior to the game. And on behalf of the police department, uh, on June 12th at 7 a.m. at Las Conchas Restaurant at 403 South Laurent, uh, they'll be hosting an event, Pan Dulce con los Policias. Um, so that sounds pretty good. Uh, I think I'll make that one. Uh, a, mor a, a morning full of information on how to keep your home, vehicle, and family safe. Las Conchas is normally closed on Monday, but is opening their location ex exclusively for this event. For any questions, please contact 361-485-3819 and ask for Officer Levadio. And that is all the announcements I have this evening. All right, uh, we'll move into public and employee recognitions. All right, before, I, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. And That's so fine. before um, I ask Christy to come up, I do wanna ask some of our uh, illustrious uh, leadership team members to either rise or come to the front. That sounds so formal, right? Uh, but we did have um, a group of, of, of members of our leadership team, uh, those being Ashley Strievel, which of course is our, our communication public affairs director, Jessica Berger, our library director, uh, Shara Martha Johnny, our human resources director, uh, Maria Bell, municipal court operations supervisor, and city secretary April Hilbrick, recently completed more than 30 hours of leadership training held over a two month period by attending the Texas Municipal League Leadership Fellows Program uh, to enhance their leadership skills. Participants explored the principles and characteristics of ethical leadership, learned to build trust and community, discovered ways to improve team building and communication skills, and practice negotiation skills for strategic influence. So we'll, we'll see how they do with me in that regard. Uh, the, the class held discussions over local issues in the broader leadership context, 
with the goal of applying learnings to their public service role and to benefit their cities and residents. Um, I've personally been through the program as well. This was several years ago, so I can attest to the quality of the program that TML puts together. Um, and as we've been saying consistently, the, we were really, really trying to invest in our employees, in their professional development. It makes us a better, makes them better leaders, makes them better managers, better people, which consequently leads to better results for the general public and improvements in the enhancement of our livability, which is our mission. And so thank you all so much for your dedication to professional development. Um, and thank you for uh, trusting in us and sticking with us. So thank you all so much. And they get fancy plaques they get to, you know, put on their office walls. That's always nice. Uh, now I'll transition to the first item on, on there, which is uh, uh, I'll, I'm going to ask Krista Euchre to come up to help uh, present our June 2023 Keep Victoria Beautiful Business Beautification Award. Good evening. Good evening, Council and Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Here you go. Uh, it is time for our June Beautification Awards, and I'm going to introduce Meredith Bird our chair for Keep Victoria Beautiful to uh, recognize our winner. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and, and Council. As chair of Keep Victoria Beautiful, I do have to say that this is one of my favorite parts of the role is getting to recognize a business here in Victoria that's doing an outstanding job of looking great, keeping, um, keeping our town beautiful, you know, embodying the mission of Keep Victoria Beautiful. And so tonight, uh, I do want to remind uh, the public that we're always accepting nominations. You can um, get in touch with one of the board members. You can go, go to the Keep Victoria Beautiful Facebook page or the uh, website. And just as you're around town, out and about, you know, keep your eyes open if you, and if you see a business that you think deserves recognition, let us know and we'll get that name, that business name before our committee and um, we will go take a look and see about awarding them with a beautification award. So this evening um, we're recognizing a business that not only has to really work to keep um, keep a handle on the, the litter on their property and in, in their parking lot just, just due to the nature of the business. They also have some really nice environmentally sound landscaping, some native and drought tolerant plants, which is really fantastic in times of, um, you know, when we're not getting rain, when it's, when we're in our, you know, seemingly uh, yearly drought. Um, it's nice to see a, a business that, that, is you know utilizing xeriscaping and and uh, water conservation and what who I'm talking about Dairy Queen on North Moody. So we know we all we all love their blizzards, but tonight we recognize them for really doing a fantastic job. You can see that um, that Texas sage on the right. That's a beautiful beautiful kind of silvery green shrub with these uh, little purple flowers that bloom right before it rains. <coughs> Um, this staff has to go out and, and pick up litter at least daily. And it's just, they're on a busy thoroughfare. They're a fast food restaurant that, that is naturally going to generate some trash just during, during the course of business. But they're doing a fantastic job. And we'd like to recognize Dairy Queen on Moody. And I'm going to bring Sabrina up here. Living in the neighborhood, I can honestly say that well, I travel by there all the time, and they do a fantastic job of keeping it uh, clean. And and what you said is, as far as the landscaping and everything, it's it's impeccable. So thank you for being such a, a great member of our community, <clears throat> and the blizzards. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, this time we'll go into items from council. Any items? I, I had one, um, and it's in regards to the um, status of the uh, splash pads. 
Yes, Can sir. Can we get an update on that? Absolutely. And I'm assuming Jason's making his way up right now. You have eyes in the back of your head. I, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Good, good that, is, that is hard to say. I'm used to the, the mayor. So, um, so really quick uh, update on the splash pads. The splash pads are something that we take very seriously anytime that we have to close them down for maintenance or any type of repairs. Um, but I did want to just go over really quickly kind of where we're at with the splash pads. Um, about in 2021, we did extend the splash pad hours uh, pretty substantially. We actually increased them throughout the day and then also the season. So they're open from March until October now. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But uh, the community center, um, we've been having some issues with that for, for quite some time. Um, and we have had contractors that have come in and have worked on it. Um, now that the contractors have come in and, and cleaned up everything that we needed them to, it's, it was it's time for us to be able to go in and actually repair the things that, that we need to. Um, so over the course of the last month and a half plus, um, we have spent in total about $6,100 in parts uh, for the community center splash pad. And the same thing with Ethel Lee Tracy Park, about $3,000 in splash pad repairs and parts. Um, miscellaneous, uh, it totals all the way up to $38,000. Um, that also includes contractors to come out and, and repair some of the issues that we have. Uh, just because splash pads are uh, a very unique feature, um, you know, I can't just get a plumber to come in and, and repair it, unfortunately. There's different components to it. Um, <clears throat> and so in total, we spent, you know, about $50,000 so far on Ethel Lee Tracy as well as Community Center splash pad. That just to try to get it up and running. Um, in addition to that, our maintenance team has been out there um, in total over the last two months, April and May, um, close to 370 hours. Um, in comparison, the same time last year, we're looking at 158 hours. So our team has been out there almost double the amount of time trying to get the splash pads up and running. So with all that being said, we are making some progress and we are making um, some good headway. So Ethel Lee Tracy Park, just really quickly, splash pad at opened in 2018 to the community. That's a water play water feature. Water play is out of Canada. And so that's some of the issue that we're having with some of our splash pads. Um, we reached out to them. They recommended a guy out of Dallas and out of Houston that specializes on their equipment. We've contacted them both said, I don't care who gets here first, whoever gets here first, let's, let's get you here. Um, we're looking at about two to three weeks from arrival for those folks. So our goal is to uh, potentially have the Ethel Lee Tracy <coughs> splash pad up and running by the end of June, first part of July. The community center, um, that one opened in 2016. That's also a water play uh, water feature. Um, again, Canada, uh, Canadian uh, made. We have the internal components, as I mentioned earlier, the repairs, and so we're already cycling that system. Uh, part of the cycling the system is making sure that our chlorine and our acid is at a correct level and is safe. Um, and so where we're at with that is uh, hopefully the next couple of weeks we'll be able to open that up. Again, um, working to make sure that we have a, a good water quality that's safe for the community to come and enjoy. Um, kind of parallel with that, we have a contractor that's also repairing some small concrete issues that are in there. Um, that way, we don't have any tripping hazards whenever we do open it. Lone Tree Creek, to be honest with you, is rocking and rolling. Uh, that was opened in 2009. Um, Craftsman is actually the people who made that, and um, Craftsman is based out of Spring, Texas. So you can kind of see the, the comparison there, those Texas companies uh, a lot easier to be able to get them down to help service some of those major issues that we have. Um, and I'll leave you with, with this one note. Uh, again, we definitely take this seriously. Um, the city of Arlington about two years ago uh, went underneath the lawsuit. Um, a young three-year-old uh, boy passed away from a brain-eating amoeba uh, that ended up from a splash pad. And it's called the Bakari Williams Protocol out of the city of Arlington. So um, we just want to make sure that we have safe splash pads for the community. Jason, the you said for the community center, you're running water, doing samples, two, three weeks in from there. But for Ethel Lee Tracy, if the work still has to be done, and you, I imagine you still have to do the same water samples, testing yada yada to make sure that the, the safety 
wouldn't that add an additional two to three weeks on? And we're already first week of June, so I'm just trying to figure out how quickly they can get work done and adding a timeline of testing. Right. How does that work out? So, so yes, sir, that's uh, the, the end of June, first part of July is what we see. If We're hopeful that if we can get him down in two weeks, uh, depending on the, the type of issue that there is, it may be something that, you know, they have a part for it in the truck and they can fix it right then and there. Um, then we can just start turning the water on and getting everything flowing. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason end of June, first part of July. Thank you. That's uh, yes, just needed some information for the public and, and myself. Just yes, do it as quick as you can. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I mean, Most it's, definitely. It's unfortunately poor timing with school out, and, yeah. and I understand you know the public's concerns and frustrations in that regard. But but thank you for looking out for the safety as well. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. Oh, do you want something? I would just suggest that we always stick with the Texas people, then, not to try and go with Canada next I, time. Okay. I would <laughs> keep it. Domestic, yeah, I, I concur. Okay. Well, and regardless of, of origin, we've already had the conversation about, you know, we've been discussing in, in general, taking a best value approach to selecting different, you know, products and projects. And, you know, we want to be more mindful moving forward about the ongoing maintenance element of any, any equipment piece that we might be buying um, so that we don't necessarily just get caught up on the initial price i.e. low bid and focus on the long term. And so, you know, we're experiencing that with these plastic pads, unfortunately, but we'll learn from it. And as we get new equipment and new elements, we'll take that into account better. A lot easier when we can do our own maintenance or have maintenance performed by someone local, obviously. Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other items? All right. We'll move on to citizens' communication at this time. Um, I will go through our stack of of sheets, uh, the mayor seems to miss when we have lots. Um, just, <laughs> just, just noted. Um, uh, anyway, um, if we all come up, uh, please state your name, and if we can keep our comments to three minutes for the other uh, speakers, I would appreciate that. Uh, we will we'll start with um, Harvey Fisk. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem. City Council members and interested citizens. Uh, after I last spoke at one of the City Council meetings, someone approached me and asked me why I bothered to speak when it seemed unlikely that I would be able to convince anyone to change their mind. That got me to think, was I like Don Quixote tilting at windmills? Perhaps I was. Then I remembered why I speak up. I speak up because I believe that Victoria has the potential to become an even greater city than it is now. So I'm back here tonight questioning why there was even a debate on the proposed grant for adding sidewalks along Main Street. In my humble mind, this seems to be a no-brainer. Right? The city would get new sidewalks. They'll help citizens have easier access along Main Street. The area would be safer for students, faculty, and staff at some nearby schools. Main Street, which is one of the main entrances to Victoria, will be more attractive. Citizens of that part of town will be able to safely walk or ride barks, bikes to Riverside Park. The area medical and mental health facilities would be more accessible to those without cars. No, I don't expect that hundreds of people would use the sidewalk every day. It will improve the lives of some Victoria residents. It has the potential to make that part of Victoria more attractive to potential business development. I fail to see the downside of this proposed project. I strongly encourage the council to reconsider the proposed grant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisk. <coughs> Janice, uh, is it Takaks? Takis. Oh, Takis. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. My name is Janice Takis. My family and I have resided in the Woodway subdivision of Victoria for the past 25 years. I am here to speak on the proposed TxDOT project concerning, excuse me. Could you speak um, into the microphone, please? Oh, I'm sorry. That it really helped. Thank you. I want to comment on the proposed TxDOT project where TxDOT would partner with Victoria to build sidewalks on both sides of Main Street from Tropical Drive to Rio Grande. Such a project would have many benefits for the community and, no pun intended, 
we should not walk away from this project. The most immediate benefit is improvement to pedestrian safety. Any pedestrian who walks on Main Street takes his or her life in their own hands, especially at the Tropical Drive entrance to Victoria West and Cade Middle School. The situation is so dire that students from Cade are not allowed to walk to school for safety reasons. In addition, these safety benefits would be extended down Main Street all the way to downtown and give sa safer access to Riverside Park. The use of these sidewalks will pr promote pedestrian safety, which in turn will encourage the use of these sidewalks, foster overall community health, improve access to businesses and facilities that will in turn stimulate the creation of new businesses and expand the economic prosperity of Victoria. These sidewalks would help connect the neighborhoods along Main Street and greater connection between neighborhoods always has numerous benefits. The west side sidewalk would be 10 feet wide, which can then be used for walking, running, and cycling. All of these are much more e environmentally friendly than the use of the automobile. All of these, excuse me, these sidewalks would improve Main Street visually. They would help define streets as orderly and give the impression of a more affluent area. Property values of homes in areas with the sidewalks would increase due to the positive connotation that sidewalks conjure. Finally, the vast majority of this project would be funded by TxDOT. In summary, sidewalks are conduits to pedestrian access. They improve social connectivity, personal safety and health, environmental su sustainability, and neighborhood appearance. We should not walk away from this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Mitchell. Good evening, Mr. Mitchell. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Council. Appreciate you giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm a avid golfer several times a week. And I go by the duck pond, you know, every time and, and watched uh, in wonder at the improvements there. And I have to applaud you for making the investment in something that will draw visitors to the city. The other entity in the park that could draw visitors to Victoria is, of course, the golf course. There was a time when Riverside Golf Course was ranked within the top 25 public golf courses in Texas. Today, not so much. I must say that since the city took over management of the golf course, there has been improvement. However, there are many things that still needed. Eliminating Dallas grass in St. Augustine on fairways and tee boxes, improving drainage, making water hazards so they hold water. But the most important need is the elimination of the wild hogs, which damage fairways and areas around the greens. Hogs can be hunted, or you can eliminate their food source. Hunting has risks, I realize, which can be mitigated. I notice that the greens don't get damaged due to a lack of food source because the greens are treated for the grubs. Treating around greens and fairways would eliminate their food source and the damage to these areas. There are other more expensive improvements such as rebuilding the greens, but eliminating the hogs is the most impressing problem and go a long way to improving playability. All of these improvements cost money, of course. It was my hope that when the city took over management that the city would subsidize the golf course from the general fund, as surrounding, surrounding communities do, as it is important to have a quality public course in the city. Instead, I've been told that the course is on a fixed budget and that profit generated by the golf course is retained by the city. I hope you can see a way to use this excess revenue and maybe some of the city's general fund to start making some of these improvements. Money the city has invested in the duck pond has not been wasted. Investment in the golf course would not be wasted either. 
but you really need to get rid of those wild hogs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Matt Oker. Good evening. Good evening. It's been some time since I've been here. I've been very nice for all of y'all. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to get through this. Uh, got something pretty weighty to talk about this evening. I'd like to start off by telling y'all a very short story about two guys that grew up in Victoria. The first one came from a farming family, second son, hardworking family, but a family of means, a family with what society would term today all the advantages, you know, self-employed, multiple business interests, never wanted for anything, a uh, backyard view of a golf course. And the second guy was a guy that grew up on the south side of Victoria. He was lucky enough to be born the oldest of five children to two very hardworking parents that I know did very well to provide, but I'm sure excess was not the norm in that household. And um, these two guys on the surface could not have appeared to be more different. Uh, they were from different races. Um, different educational experiences, different economic experiences, <clears throat> um, different faiths, a lot of things that were different. But these two fellows became good friends, ironically, because of this government of this city. And um, I'm talking about two fellows. I am the first one. The second one is a name that I hope would be very familiar to all of you. His name was Gabriel Solis. Sadly, we lost Gabriel, who was a great friend of mine about five years ago. <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, I will never forget, even though that day of his funeral was somewhat cloudy for me, being one of the pallbearers, um, I can't recall if we were retrieving the casket from the hearse to take it into the sanctuary or if we were placing it in the hearse. I don't recall, but I do remember one thing. I remember a bunch of firemen lined up, and they were all in their dress uniform, and uh, it was a very regal moment, and his mother spoke to it at the time. And um, I, had, I had known a little bit about why those guys were there, but I found out a lot more later. Gabriel was very instrumental, mostly behind the scenes, because that's how he worked, and getting, I think you call it a burn tower or firehouse or whatever you call it, where the, the firemen go and train in kind of a live action sequence, if you will. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Gabriel, Gabriel was a very deep person. He and I had a lot of long talks about politics, religion, philosophy, all these things. I have a degree in philosophy, and Gabriel could still teach me about philosophy if he were here today. But two things that really rang true to him about that firehouse and why it was so important to him was it brought two elements to this city and that is very vital to every community. One is personal safety for those that are out there doing things that are dangerous. And the second was preservation of property. And um, I come here tonight just to ask that someone start the conversation about possibly naming that tower after Gabriel Solis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Russell Putnam. Good evening, Mr. Putnam. Good evening. I would like to share a brief story about a remarkable Victoria woman who contributed something wonderful, something really special that's been special to the citizens of Victoria for four decades. Now, I, I have given each of you a, a, a brief resume of what I'm going to, going to read here. Uh, so I'm just going to pick through because I'm, I'm sure I would go over three minutes. But among her many varied and superb artistic talents, Nile San Putnam was enthusiastically involved with local theater in Victoria. Her debut in this genre came when she played Golda in Victoria Summer Musical Repertory Company's 1995 production of Fiddler on the Roof. It's been a while. And in all, Nylis exhibited her incredibly varied talents in no less than 21 major stage and televised productions and taught our children and others to speak before large audiences, 
to act, to sing, and to dance. Additionally, this indefatigable almost indestructible woman took teams of teenagers, not only from Victoria, but from all across Texas to towns in Mexico, Central America, South America, South Africa, Botswana, and many others. She and our children lived for an entire summer in Belize, where at the request of a personal advisor to the president of Belize, Nylis was introduced to a group of indigenous Belizean Mayan girls to whom she then taught over the next several weeks the lost cultural art of casting clay pottery. Oh, sorry, look at that, best laid plans. <clears throat> Sadly, Nylis passed away at our home on December 5th, 2022, after a long and debilitating illness. But since the early 1980s, Victorians have loved the duck pond in Riverside Park. But what virtually no one knows today is that Nylis Putnam designed and laid out the duck pond and gazebo in the summer of 1982. And considering the high rate of citizen approval over the next 40 years, she did her usual excellent job. I see my time has expired, so I'm just going to let you read the rest of the comments, see the photo co photographs. Um, after the massive hurricane damage, there are, of course, renovations to her design. But whenever you spend a few relaxing moments out there, remember that the original concept was Nylis's. And I would like to submit at this time the proposal that city council might consider naming it after her, the Nylis Putnam Memorial Duck Pond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Putnam. Oh, is Jason still here? Do we, we, can, we can show this if you like. If you want to oh, get a sure. picture of this? Um, so people yeah, I presented a copy of this to, to um, Jesus, but I want to present this one to, to Jason. Okay. Yeah, come on up, Jason, if you don't mind. We've had an opportunity uh, to meet um, and just begin conversations, explore options. And so we're Wonderful. still Thank you. in the process of that. Thank you. We're sorry for Thank your you for loss. sharing. Thank yes. you. Um, Robert Rangel. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Um, Really, this is kind of off guard. This is my first time being here, but I'm actually here in reference to a property that uh, my mom is trying to inherit due to grandparents not leaving a will. Uh, we're trying to get all the paperwork and everything done. I've submitted drafts to the city. Basically, they did want to condemn the building. Um, we are in the process of, of trying to either save the house. Uh, in other words, we're having to fly over airship to my mother since my grandparents didn't leave a will. Um, and it's taken a little bit longer than we thought. Um, and this is sort of new to us, uh, even at per our last meeting that we had to go to to protect or, or talk about the property uh, to try to at least get the appeal. We've been in contact with the lawyers. Also, on top of that, I was able to bring the drafts of the airship that's almost done now after almost two or three years, uh, as well as we got in contact with contractors. Uh, and so the reason I'm just asking here is just that we have or buy some more time uh, just so that I'm able to help or save the property. Um, it's just a learning process for us. Uh, it was inherited to my mother. Uh, my brother and I are now having to step in, and it is a little frustrating because even though we went to the meeting the last time, nobody's really given us any information. It's, uh, you know, we, we, it's not abandoned home. We go to the house. We got the yard picked up. Uh, yes, the house needs work, but basically uh, we just need some more time. And, um, I mean, it's crazy. I find it funny that here we are fighting or 
talking about golf courses and sidewalks and stuff, and I'm here to save my property. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's just the reason why I'm here. Um, like I said, if we could just buy a little more time. Uh, and it would be nice if somebody from the city could tell us what needs to happen. I mean, normally it's just like, this is what needs to go. This, it's a learning process. Let's just put it that way. Uh, we're trying our best to do everything that we can, and I can't help but feel a little frustrated with the city just on how quick their actions are just to want to come and knock down, condemn, instead of trying to work with us. Uh, like I said, we it, it was a learning process. We're learning now, and I have come up with a couple of more plans since our last meeting before we had to come in here again and speak with you guys. Um, yeah, that's the thing too. Um, it, it's kind of hard until it's signed over to my mother's name. It is kind of hard for us to move forward. You know, why spend the money or even do anything to it if the city is just going to take the property? Uh, like I said, it's just a learning process. Yes, it's just a learning process and we're just trying to get through it. We just need some more time just to try to save the property. And Mayor Pro Tem and Council, just for reference, this is about item um, E2, which you will hear about later in the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Uh, Naomi Flonori. <coughs> good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I was coming up here to give everybody a good chewing up about uh, the sidewalks, but I am going to speak to the citizens of Victoria. How much or how well do you know your council members? When is the last time you've seen our council members at a function? When is the last time you've been able to speak to your council member? You, we never see our council members anywhere unless it's time to vote for them. Then they're everywhere. Once they get our votes, all eight or 10 or 15% of us, then they're gone. We need to get out here and vote. Southside is not getting what they need. Southside have meetings once a month and the people that matter are not there. It's time to hold people accountable. No disrespect to you all, but citizens, if they, if they want you here, they need to call your office and you need to show up because you don't know what's happening if they don't contact you. But we need more from you besides a, a name tag. Now, for Mark Lofgren, you come. But either people know your face or know your name, but they can't put two and two together. So what I would advise you to do is maybe wear a shirt to say, hi, my name is Mark Lofgren. <laughs> but you show up. I will say that no matter where I am, because I volunteer and do different things, I always see you. But it's a lot of people who don't know you. There's a lot of people in Victoria that don't understand that they're registered to vote. I'm a volunteer deputy registrar, and a lot of them say, I don't wanna vote because my vote won't matter. It doesn't matter what race, religion, creed you are. Your vote is the equalizer. If you love Victoria and you want Victoria to matter like you say it does, vote. If you think you can do a better job, if you think you can, put your name on the ballot. Stop sitting back like me, and I'm guilty of it too. Stop sitting back complaining on Facebook about what people woulda, coulda, shoulda did. Because we all can. We all can. I wanna see more from the district. I wanna see more from each district besides you all sitting up here saying that people in Victoria don't walk. Watch me as I walk out the door. Thank you. <laughs> Jewel Buchanan. I know this name. Good evening. Hello, city council members and mayor pro tem. My name is Jewel Buchanan 
and I live at 201 Creek Ridge Drive in Springwood. It's a small neighborhood right off of Main Street. My sons attended three schools along Main Street, including Cade, West, and St. Joe. Living off of, Saint, of Main Street means that I drive up and down that street multiple times a day, all times of day and night. And I'm here speaking to you because when I watched the city council meeting from a couple of weeks ago, specifically the discussion of the 80-20 grant to add the multi multi-use hike and bike trail, the sidewalk, and the updated signals from Tropical Arcade and West Star all the way to Rio Grande, I was frustrated by the lack of data that was referenced at the meeting and just the anecdotal commentary by the members who wound up voting no to more than $5 million of grant money that would have provided safe inter-neighborhood connectivity, pedestrian access to schools, churches, restaurants, and healthcare along Main Street, not to mention access to Riverside Park, our library, and other downtown amenities. I don't plan to go all scorched earth on those who say that Victoria prefer, Victorians prefer to be inside on their devices or that Victoria is just not a pedestrian town. But surely you realize that Main Street is not currently pedestrian friendly. Even though I see students walk from school daily as far as Mockingbird Lane, I see adults walking by the railroad tracks to get to Nursery Drive, whether to get to work or to access health care. Recreational cycling is also dangerous. As a family who regularly rode bikes together, when we moved to Victoria in 2007, we attempted to bike to Woodway and to Riverside Park, but only once. The patchwork of unconnected sidewalks and the lack of safe road crossings made it too dangerous to attempt as a family and definitely too dangerous to allow our sons to bike to see friends in nearby unconnected neighborhoods. Just this weekend when leaving the farmer's market, my husband and I saw a couple of two or three seventh, eighth grade girls on bikes at the intersection of Airline and Main. As a matter of fact, just today, I saw a man jogging through the grass on Main. A council member said that she doubted anyone was going to ride all the way from the north side down to downtown. We have so many cyclists, running clubs, and families who would do exactly that. But that's not the only benefit of this project. That's like saying we don't need I-35 because nobody's going to go all the way from Laredo to the Great Lakes. It ignores the fact that many people will be connected for shorter trips. Just as 35 connects San Antonio to San Marcos, this project would connect Tropical to Tonto. It would connect the new VA clinic to the new public safety building. Churches would be connected so members could walk to Sunday lunch at Pinto Bean, Las Palmas, or the New Venturas. Though we have missed this grant opportunity, as a grant writer myself, I know that there are other grants out there for the safety of pedestrian cyclists and that this very grant may be available to you guys again in the spring. It's my hope that Victoria uses data, the Victoria, I'm sorry, I see the red light. It's my hope for Victoria's benefit that when these opportunities arise in the future, council members will use data and citizen input to make their decision. In the words of some council members who definitely understood the assignment two weeks ago, if you build it, they will come. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Vondero. Good evening, uh, Good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Michael Vondero. I live at 2204 East North Street, Lot 20A. Uh, I was going to talk about the appraisals. You know, it's more than just looking at it on the outside and, you know, taking a picture of it. it it's the quality of your neighbors and the quality of your neighborhood. You know, I mean, I was sandwiched between two sex offenders. And the only reason the other sex offender isn't there because he got arrested for burglary of a habitation and he got four years in prison starting in May, and he's already due up for parole in June, and he, he just got there. You know, they should let him stay for two years because if they make parole, I'm the one that has to live by all, all these people. So I, I tell the Board of Parole and Pardons, you know, you need to hire a security guard, you know, 24 hours a day for, you know, letting them out early. And um, also, you know, it's the... What goes on, like, for instance, there's some businesses, a car wash, there's so much traffic, I can't even wash my car there. You know, it's by the Salvation Army, and 
whole bunch of people knocked over that fence there and no one's uh, fixing it and there's a pit bull and about five other big large dogs running around with no leash over there and you know there's people living at the car wash the church that business by the salvation army and that should decrease the uh, appraisal rate, you know, just a bad quality of environment and, you know, sketchy looking people and stuff like that. And that should always be considered uh, whenever there's appraisal. I, I don't know if you remember the Crips took over a neighborhood and the Army Rangers came and they shot them up and everything. And their uh, house went from $10,000 to over $400,000 because they cleaned it up and the uh, police department cleaned it up. And uh, my, I have a trailer house that's just filled with algae right beside me and stuff. That's been there for about two years. It looks like they got it uh, in, uh, you know, from the Guadalupe River or somewhere and just threw it there. But you should always look for the quality of everything. And I do appreciate the appraisal people for their job. And I do hope they can get like a three month extension from May 15th. That was the deadline. And that's it. Have a good, good evening. Appreciate it, Dr. Bonner Yeager. Captain Kenny Jones. Good evening, Captain. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Pro Tem and Council. And uh, I have to tell you, I see several of y'all everywhere I go. So I know I go a lot of places. So especially uh, Ms. Solis, I see you and ever, ever there. So uh, I just want to, about three years ago, it seems like uh, I was shaving at 7.30 in the morning. And this guy calls me. I didn't even know him. And he called me and said, I have an idea for you. The city wants to buy a trailer and put it on your property. And let's have a, uh, a day center. And I, I liked the ideal. So uh, that began the ball rolling. And then COVID came and uh, several other things happened. But the city uh, has uh, allocated $250,000 to us uh, upon y'all's uh, word uh, this evening. And so I wanted to come and reinforce uh, the need for this. This is going to be a life enrichment center, and what it will entail is uh, a place where folks can come not to hang out, but a place where folks can come and get uh, emergency medical service, such as wound care, and uh, we're going to have uh, 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 dental staff uh, involved, dental technicians, hygienists, and that sort of thing, doing free care. Uh, we're going to have a library. We're going to have life skills classes, GED classes, uh, food handlers, uh, which the Army will be paying for, food handlers classes, food managers uh, classes, to where when folks come and they get these, they can immediately go to work. Uh, we'll also be having uh, uh, different types of uh, life skills as far as um, uh, money management and just simple life things uh, that, that folks are, are, are needing to help them get back into uh, the swing of things. And this is not going to be just a center for uh, the homeless. It'll be a center for those, anybody in that neighborhood or, or in the, the county of Victoria that wants to utilize this program. Uh, this has been in the works for about three years. Uh, we've gone from a trailer being brought in on our property to taking up uh, over 2,000 square feet of our current building, uh, remodeling uh, for this uh, venture. We're also going to offer uh, some uh, immediate uh, need items like hygiene, showers, laundry, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's not going to be uh, anything like what we have now uh, in the city for uh, those that are not just homeless, but those that are in need of the services that we're going to offer. Uh, in support of this, I have some board members here. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Peter Reese, uh, Rick Villa, uh, my board chair, Nikki LaGrega, um, Oh, yeah, Elaine Phillips, Miss Elaine Phillips. Uh, uh, also, uh, Chief uh, Young is here. He's on our board. He took uh, uh, our, our outgoing chief's place. And uh, uh, um, Mike Etienne is not here tonight, I don't guess. But he's an overflow. <laughs> <laughs> if he can hear me. Um, 
Yeah. Well, he does at the board meetings too. So, but you know what? We're privileged to have a city member. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, my time is almost up, and and uh, uh, I have to think of things to say to make three minutes. But uh, we just want you to, uh, of course, affirm. Uh, what uh, the city manager uh, and his crew and the attorney of the city has um, allocated for us. We thank the city of Victoria for giving us the privilege uh, to serve the community, and we will do the very best uh, that we know how in making sure that we're a viable resource, not just another program. Thank you. Thank you. You used that four minutes well. <laughs> 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 and lastly, uh, Ms. Jill Fox. As she walks up, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, I just want to uh, clarify that um, the item that Captain Kenny Jones is speaking about is on consent, and what we're referring to is, is money stemming from ARPA funds. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jill Fox, and currently I have the privilege of serving as chair of the Victoria Public Library Advisory Board. A few weeks ago, I received a late evening phone call from a local physician whose son and daughter-in-law had taken their four-year-old child to the Victoria Public Library that afternoon. Having spent some time happily exploring the bins of board books in our juvenile section, the little boy presented his parents with several books that he wanted to take home. His parents were dismayed to find among his collection two specific books, the first being Born Ready, the true story of a boy named Penelope, and the second being I Am Not a Girl. Both preschool age stories of young children trying to convince the adults in their worlds that they are really of another gender. Sadly, this family has vowed not to visit the library again. Several months ago, this esteemed body reviewed and edited a juvenile collection policy for the Victoria Public Library that had been drafted and approved by the Library Advisory Board. The edits made by this body <coughs> included the removal of the terms gender dysphoria and gender tra transitioning from the list of book topics to be placed apart from the juvenile general collection. The event that I have just described, as well as numerous conversations between library users and advisory board members, and legislation that has been passed in the 88th session of the Texas legislature, including Senate Bills 13, 14, and 900, indicate that it is surely time to revisit this issue in our juvenile collection policy. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Thank you, Ms. Fox. That concludes our citizens' communication part. Um, there are no items with public hearings, and so we will move over. Um, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. James, would you come over? As we do with a little technical issue, we will move on to the consent agenda. Okay. Item D1 is the adoption of minutes of the regular meeting on May 16, 2023. Item D2 is the, an ordinance approving a budget amendment to the FY23 budget in the amount of $284,304.70 to cover the cost of paid time off payout plan for applicable city employees. ID 
Item D3 is an ordinance authorizing a variance to section 14-10B of the city code for property located at 2804 North Laurent Street to allow for the sale of alcohol. Both of those items were on second and third reading. Item D4 is a resolution reappointing three members to the Victoria Development Commission Board of Directors. Item D5 is a resolution approving the second amended interlocal agreement for mutual access to cloud library digital resources with the Texas Cloud Link Group. Item D6 is a resolution approving the renewal of the interlocal cooperation contract with the Department of State Health Services Vital Statistics Unit for the Remote Certification Program. Item D7 is a resolution approving a variance to Section 21-83A2 for the property located at 70, 10, and 7102 North Navarro in order to allow for the platting of three general commercial lots with one of the lots having a lot width below the minimum lot width requirement. And item D8 is a resolution approving an interlocal agreement with Victoria Independent School District for a plan review and inspection services for the Mission Valley Elementary School rebuild project. And item D9 is a resolution approving a community grant agreement with the Salvation Army for the Life Enrichment Center in the amount of $250,000. I'll move for approval of the consent agenda as read. Second. We have a uh, motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Um, all those opposed, same sign. Uh, consent agenda is passed as read. I keep looking over here like I can help, and I know <laughs> nothing about computers. I'm lost. Yeah. No, no, not a bit. Is it keyboard, mouse, what? <laughs> mouse is not the mouse but pad. I'm interested. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he always tells me. Just use the mouse pad. <laughs> James, is it on? Yeah. <laughs> Turn it off. Turn it back on. Miss Elise, would you like me to, uh, to move over to in pause? Ricky's place? Yeah, I was going to say, James, if it's to, easier. Just move, move over to Ricky's just place. Move over to Ricky's. Thank you. You can come over here. I'm out in left yeah, field over here. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. This was closer. <laughs> For. Uh, for all the OCD people in the audience and on and watching the TV, um, it's it's very symmetrical this way. <laughs> so yes. I just much better. Thank you. Um, the plates are off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going there. Um, and then we'll move on to action items. Item E1 is a resolution hearing an appeal of the Building and Standards Commission's demolition order for 3606 Callis. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. So on May um, 23rd, 2023, uh, the Building Standards Commission did issue an order for demolition for this property at 3606 Callis, which includes um, the primary um, residence on the property as well as an accessory structure. Um, code enforcement um, first began investigating this property in May of 2022, so a year ago. Um, and observed the substandard structure um, it has had major weather damage and um, is the the envelope is uh, missing quite a few sections and there are holes throughout the property. Um, code enforcement also found that um, all of the MEP or mechanical electrical plumbing systems are substandard or not working condition. Um, so I have a few pictures that I think really tell a much better story than me getting up here and listing all the deficiencies. Um, this property, this picture was taken yesterday. As you can see, there's. Um, a large hole by the front door and um, there's missing siding up uh, near the roof line. Okay, I thought it was working, James. Looks like it's on. Your mouse problems. I apologize. <laughs> that would be mice problems. <laughs> You're right. Oh, sorry. Oh, I messed it up now. Okay, so you can see um, the blue tarp is um, providing coverage to uh, large areas of the home that are missing siding. Um, there's a lot of wood watt uh, along the foundation of the home. It's missing electrical components. Um, there are holes throughout inside and um, outside with collapsed ceiling, um, there's a hole in the roof, and a lot of debris inside. This is the accessory structure that's, again, um, also in a substandard condition. Um, and so 
staff does recommend that the um, council uphold the commission's order and provide um, demolition of the property. The taxes owed on the property is approximately $17,000. Uh, the contract labor liens, um, which are mowing liens that are owed are $753. And the value of um, the entire lot and structure is $34,000. So um, for those reasons, and of course the condition of the home, the Building Standards Commission did issue an order for demolition. Julie, what funds were you using to demolish the house? Um, it would be general fund, our, our uh, demolition funds that are budgeted to code enforcement. Not CDBG? No, it's not eligible for CDBG funds because it has the back taxes. Okay, but um, don't you have to have clear title before you You also have to have clear title. Um, and have all your taxes owed. And, and right now, um, if you included, if you um, read the packet in the um, appeal letter, they did provide um, an affidavit at airship um, that shows that there are six heirs, but that has not all been cleaned up and put into one heir's name, um, which is, I think, what the property owner or the, um, the appealant is trying to do is convert um, or have all of her siblings sign over the property into her one name. So it's under one ownership. So can we demolish that without that paper? Yes. Yes. Because isn't that what they're asking for, time to be able to get? I believe they're asking time to get that situated, so then they're more willing to put money into the property. Because it, it, we run into this a lot, where um, when there's a lot of heirs with a property, there's a hesitancy for one person to then do a lot of investment in a substandard property, because they don't have Clear. The person putting in the money won't, doesn't necessarily have clear title themselves, but they're sharing um, ownership with several other siblings or nieces, nephews, whatever family relationships there may be. Has there been any discussion with them about if they can get it into one heir, as I understood from both the application that they were filing letters of airship and that sort of thing about what their plan is after that? So we have not seen a detailed plan. That is what is requested um, in the notices that are sent out for Building Standards Commission. Um, again, at the commission, it's my understanding there was not a detailed plan that was submitted, and that is um, you know, also a reason for proceeding with demolition. There's a considerable amount of work to be um, done to bring this property back into compliance. What, what's the timing? You said May of 22 is when you first uh, started working with this. Notices were first I mean, When were they contacted? Was it just a month ago when they got the, the building and standards meeting, or was it back in May? No, it's usually about six weeks or after we... For, so when we first start, we send to the registered owner on the appraisal district. And then before the Building Standards Commission, which usually is about six to eight weeks before, um, then we send notice to everyone that appeared on the title search. The gentleman that spoke earlier, is he still here? Or did, did they leave? Uh, we think they left. Okay. Potentially just who knows. Don't want to assume why. I would like to ask some questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we could double check. Maybe they wouldn't go hang out with Mike. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Atien. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you for Anybody checking. else have any I'm questions for Julie? What did you say? Does anybody else have any questions for Ms. Fogel? Sure. Oh. You said you, there hadn't been any communication with you as to what their plan might be. They're they're still just trying to Yeah, the only request is, is basically it would have been about time and not um, a, a fully detailed plan like we asked. Um, how much time did they ask for? I don't know that. I think it's just been more time. Okay. I don't think they have a clear um, timeline of when it's going to, how long it's going to take to actually clear out the um, the title issues and putting it into one name, getting all of the signatures required. Um, and I think there's hesitancy. Well, or they they spoken to hesitancy of expending funds until that process is completed. Sure, and I totally understand that from their smart. I know that sometimes that, while it sounds like a pretty quick process, it does take some time to go through mm -hmm. that, uh, particularly dealing not only with the legal system, but also with family. So that's why I was curious if 
there had been a plan if there was a specific amount of time asked for and that sort of thing. So that, those are the questions I would have for them, but unfortunately they're not here, so. And if we were to demolish the property, they're still the owners of the property, correct? Absolutely, um, so if, if the um, demolition order is upheld, then they still have 30 days, or well, we're in the middle of 30 days, they have 30 days from May 23rd to perform the demolition themselves. We always um, encourage and advise and ask people to perform the demolition themselves, um, because of course it saves the city <coughs> money, um, but then if they were not to perform that demolition by June 23rd, then we would start the contracting process, and probably in sometime in July, demolish it, and then that's when they would receive a bill. Um, if the bill is not paid, then a lien is placed on the property. And open the okay. pictures that there were furniture and that sort of thing, is somebody actually living in the property? No. Okay. And These are oftentimes, um, I speak for myself, some of the most gut-wrenching decisions because there's uh, emotion put into these homesteads and there's history. Um, so uh, we don't take this lightly. Um, are there any further questions? No, I was just going to add to that. But as Mr. Vonderon said, you know, it, it impacts the neighborhood yeah. and everybody has a right to live next to well-maintained property. All right. At this time, I will uh, call the question. Uh, let me get my thing here. Maybe. I move we adopt. Thank, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. We, we had a motion. I made a motion that we adopt I uh, withholding. Or w w upholding, I'm sorry, upholding. I second it. Okay, we have a motion. Go ahead. Here, the motion is to deny the appeal and uphold the uh, finding of the Building and Standards, Standards Commission. Correct. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, it wasn't worded better than, than it was. So saying. we have a motion and a second to uphold the, the demolition of the property. Um, and deny the appeal. And deny the appeal. Thank you. Um, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. We'll move on to E2. Item E2 is a resolution appointing members to the Board of Health. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Young and Council. The resolution before you tonight would appoint two members to the Victoria County Public Health Department Board of Health. So the purpose of that board is to um, advise the director of the overall operation of Victoria County Public Health Department on matters of public health and policies for the department. So the, the board is composed of nine members that um, three of, ha of them have to be uh, legally qualified, licensed and practicing physicians in Victoria County. One of them must be a legally qualified, uh, licensed and practicing dentist. There must be at least one registered nurse. Um, the city of Victoria this is a dual appointed board. So the city of Victoria appoints five of those nine members and the county commissioners appoint the other four. Kind of historically, the city of Victoria has handled most of the appointments of the um, positions that are named in the, <laughs> in the requirements, such as the doctors, the RN, things like that. Um, we always try to make sure, I always try to make sure that those um, requirements are fulfilled when we do appointments if the county has not already appointed any of those members. So the board members cannot serve more than two consecutive or two successive three-year terms, and that's according to the interlocal agreement that's in place currently with the county. Um, and vacancies are filled by the appointment of the body that originally appointed that member. So there's a list of the current members, the city appointees as well as the county ones. Um, you can see that um, Ms. Darla Straw there and Dr. Cano uh, their appointments are running out this month. So, and they're unfortunately both not eligible for reappointment. So we did get some um, applicants with the health of Director Gonzalez from the health department. We got some very good applicants. So um, Regina Bryan, um, who unfortunately could not make it tonight. She did tell me she was on vacation, wouldn't be able to, to come tonight to speak on her own behalf. And then Dr. Um, Julia Mitchell have submitted applications for appointments. So that would um, take care of the one doctor appointment that we need and also would put an additional RN on the board uh, as the county has already appointed one RN, but there's always room for another <laughs> and having people that understand those policies and things that the health department puts in place. So if you have any questions, I'm here as well as um, 
David from the health department. And Dr. Mitchell's Dr. Mitchell's here as well. Here yes. as well. We can put her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I say we put her on the spot. <laughs> Well, one, I'd like to. I'll take yeah. one for the team for, I'd ask Dr. Mitchell if she wanted to speak, and she politely declined, but she's more than welcome to. But we do appreciate, obviously, the, the service by Dr. Kano and Darla, and then, um, obviously, the future service of uh, both Regina and Dr. Mitchell. So, And we um, obviously recommend those appointments. Took the words right out of my mouth. Appreciate, <laughs> okay, appreciate their service and appreciate your upcoming service. Absolutely. I will make a motion for the appointment of uh, Mrs. Byrne and Dr. Mitchell. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. All right. All right. So that brings City us, manager reports. That's right. City manager's reports. Let's see what we got tonight. <laughs> Uh, we do have uh, three reports for you this evening, and the first two are have some overlap in them, and so I want to provide some context before I ask Mike to uh, introduce the first um, city manager report. Uh, but the first city manager report is um, presentation or discussion uh, overview of an appraisal report that we had done for the library. Um, as you know, we typically have conversations surrounding real estate matters in executive session, and so I want to be clear that our intent and our purpose in providing this information this evening is, for the most part, informational. Um, obviously, yes, give you an opportunity to ask questions if you like, uh, but our expectation is to not necessarily have a conversation about, you know, an offer amount or anything to that extent. Um, but that's up to y'all. Uh, but from our perspective, we think it's important uh, to provide this information uh, publicly, um, specifically because it's already being discussed publicly because of, of the county um, hearing a separate appraisal report. And so we wanted to make sure we provided more context and more information around that. Um, but I'm going to ask Mike uh, to step up and uh, continue this, this specific topic. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, good evening, Mayor Potep and uh, City Council. So since uh, last year, um, the City of Victoria <laughs> has been exploring the feasibility of purchasing the library from the county. So in May uh, 2022, uh, the city ordered an appraisal and we hired Valbridge property advisors to do the appraisal of the uh, library building. The appraisal came in at $2.9 million. Subsequently in April, the count, April 2023, the county ordered a separate appraisal and they hired Valbridge uh, property advisors out of Houston and their appraisal came in at $3.3 million. The report was presented to the county commissioner's court um, last month. So um, at this time, I would like our appraiser to present our appraisal to you. And our appraiser is Brett Weatherby. Uh, Brett has been involved or been working as an appraiser for the past 20 years. He is the senior managing partner for Valbridge Property Advisors San Antonio. He is also the past president of South Texas Chapter of Appraisal Institute. He is well qualified and uh, he will now present our appraisal to you. Uh, good evening. I had to fix the mic here. A little height difference here between Mike and I. But uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, thank you so much um, for having me be able to speak here this evening. Uh, first, I'll address the elephant in the room. Obviously, as Mike indicated, there's been two appraisals completed on the property, one by Valbridge Property Advisors San Antonio Austin, my firm, and one completed by Valbridge Property Advisors Houston. Um, just so you know, we are independently owned and operated. Uh, we are separate firms, but we are all under the same Valbridge um, umbrella. I did reach out once I found out this information uh, a few weeks back that the uh, separate appraisal had been completed. Um, they were not informed that our office had done the appraisal. Um, so obviously in these situations, uh, they indicated they would have recused themselves from the appraisal if they would have known that our office had done an appraisal of the same property in the recent past. So 
I'll start with that. Uh, my name is Brett Weatherby. I'm an MAI, AIGRS. I've been appraising for 20 years. Um, I reside in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, my primary market is South Texas. I do appraisal work uh, in Victoria, San Antonio, uh, the Rio Grande Valley, Laredo, everywhere in between, and then work outside the state of Texas as needed by clients. Um, as Mike indicated, I was engaged by the uh, city of Victoria and uh, specifically Mike to appraise the public library along with a, a parcel of excess land at 306 North Liberty Street. Uh, in addition, a supplemental analysis was done to quantify the potential market rent for the library. Um, I think each of you have been provided a copy of the report. Um, short notice, I apologize for not having an extensive power, PowerPoint, but it's a lengthy report as you can imagine. Um, a brief overview of the appraisal process. Um, as an appraiser, we're contracted to work. We establish the scope of work for an appraisal assignment, which includes touring the subject property, measuring improvements as needed, indicating various forms of depreciation, quality, construction characteristics of a property. And then once that's done, uh, we look to confirm comparable sales data, comparable rental data, uh, cost information, and land sales data. Obviously, we're dealing with a very unique property. It would be indicated as a special use property, a public library. Um, there is not actually an active market for libraries across the country. Um, there have been sales. We have researched sales data across the country through a, a proprietary database. And there are very few. And when they do sell, they are typically older, historic, schoolhouse type libraries um, that have been converted to a different use. Um, you know, the subject property, Again, it is located at 302 North Main Street, right down the street, and at 306 North Liberty Street. It is a 2.225 acre site uh, with an approximate 33,000 square foot library. Uh, it's a rather large library, but it's configured like most you'd expect, large open book space, um, customer service area, back area, et cetera. Um, part of the scope of work was to determine how we were gonna value the property. And I say we, an associate of mine, Christopher Swisher, assisted me on the appraisal. And we both toured it um, and had a very good opportunity to talk with the head librarian to get information and gather information about the property itself. Um, the two There's three approaches to valuing real estate, and that would be the cost sales comparison, or sometimes referred to as the market approach, and the income approach. Uh, typically, most people would be familiar with the sales comparison approach, where you would compare like sales of similar properties to one another under various elements of comparison and come up with a value or a value range. For properties like the subject, the library, it's very unique, as I said. So the sales comparison approach becomes very difficult to do <coughs> because there are very few, if any, library sales, and specifically in the Victoria market, um, being that typically you have one, if not maybe two libraries in any particular city of this size. The, because of that, we started with the cost approach, which includes valuing the underlying land with area land sales, and then using cost manuals and cost information from prior appraisals of like properties to come up with what it would cost to build the library today, less any depreciation. And when I say depreciation, the library was built some years ago. So you look at depreciation tables to determine how much the value of the property has diminished over its lifetime. So you take the land value, add the replacement cost new, less depreciation to come up with a value for the property. Unfortunately, the cost to build a library today is fairly extensive. So when you have a property like the library where the land is worth what it is, but the construction costs today are so great, you're likely gonna have a cost approach value that's well above what you would, would see with a sales comparison or an income approach. Due to the limited number of sales in the immediate area and region, we felt that the sales comparison approach wasn't truly applicable. Now, saying that, I did look at area building sales in Victoria and the surrounding area to see if there was any discernible way to compare and or adjust like properties, be it vacant office buildings, to the library to come with a reasonable opinion of value. It was my opinion that there was no real realistic way to do that because the money you would have to spend to convert a library to a functional office building would take a considerable amount of money to even truly make it comparable. So the only other approach we felt was applicable was the income approach. Now the income approach 
is also tricky because what would you rent a library for? So the focus there was to find other institutional or government entities that rent properties throughout the region, starting with Victoria and working outward from there. Luckily, I've had a lot of experience with Health and Human Services, Department of Public Safety, <coughs> government entities like that, that do rent properties throughout Texas. There are far more properties rented by state, federal agencies than you can think of, and they all have very similar lease structures and rental rates. So also, those properties tend to be very unique and configured in a way that would be typically only for a governmental use and would also require some extensive you know, monies in order to convert them back to a more typical office, retail, industrial use. So through that process, we estimated a market rent. We gathered rents across the region and reconciled a rental rate, what somebody would rent the library for, and then you capitalize that by a rate to get to value. Um, it be, once that's done, there is a, quite a bit of a difference between the cost and the income. What that indicates is that there's obsolescence. Nobody would build that library today to get the rent they could get. You know, you just wouldn't do it. So that obsolescence is essentially de deducted from that cost approach to get to a value. So ultimately, you're doing a cost approach to get a starting point and then an income approach to tell you how much you wouldn't spend to build a library. Um, the supplemental analysis we conducted was done to help show the city different structures of leases. If you were gonna rent the property with the tenant paying all the expenses or if they were gonna rent the property and have the landlord pay all the expenses. So just a differential in rental rates, same lease terms, all the rest. Um, just to really conclude, <laughs> Our value conclusions, the overall value of the library was estimated at $2.93 million, and the excess land, which was a 0.4435 acre tract at North Liberty, was $80,000 uh, for a total of $3,010,000. The, the excess land really wasn't, was just a, a, wanted a, a known value of a kind of a supplemental parking lot. I know the idea today was to speak specifically to the value of the library. Um, again, I feel very confident in our value. Uh, we did look at rental rates, historic rental rates in the Victoria market to help support the rental rates that were shown by governmental and institutional properties. Feel confident in the rental rate and the income approach that was presented in the report. And I think the cost approach is also very reflective of the uh, value of the property less depreciation and obsolescence. If you have any. I have a question. Sure. Okay, you said that the value of the property was 2.93 million? That's correct. And then the excess or the the parking lot across was an 80 million, so that brings it back up to three point something. Wouldn't that be equal to what the county got then? Um, I believe the county, I, I did receive a copy of the other appraisal. I have read it. Uh -huh. I have not reviewed it ex extensively, but I believe they only valued the library itself. I don't believe they rent, they valued the, the land across the street. And also, and the land across the street is ours, isn't it? It's the city of Victoria's, yes, not the, the county's. The excess land is a uh, city owned property. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, this was done obviously in 2022. <coughs> the county's being a newer appraisal. Is there anything about the lax, lapse of time that causes you any concern about your valuations you came to at that point? Uh, no, I don't think that. I think the biggest issue was during obviously the period of COVID was, was more of a concern on value, but I think the time frame between now with what's happened with interest rates and such, I think being a very unique property, I think the value has stayed relatively stable since my date of appraisal. Okay. Is that because it's a, a uh, governmental building because um, Victoria has experienced a a large increase in property values as all of our taxpayers are, are very aware uh, values went up significantly uh, in really in this past year and so I do notice the difference in dates and to me that's more significant right the uh, and, and, and obviously I do quite a bit of work with appraisal districts as well um, what we've seen is during the COVID time frame that most appraisal districts were very wary about raising taxes or assessed values on properties, speaking in general across. 
Um, and a lot of the increases in taxable or assessed values we were seeing in rural land where most property is under an ag exemption, so there's no real impact on the taxes. Since COVID has kind of abated somewhat, we've seen counties become more aggressive in their reassessing and, and valuing of properties across most of Central and South Texas. Um, but the, the library itself is tax exempt, so there is no taxes on the property. For the purpose of this analysis, I did have to interject an uh, estimated taxes for the property to get an, act, an accurate value by the income approach. Because realistically, for this property to be rented, it would be a sale leaseback where the county or a government agency would essentially sell the property and then rent it back and remain a tenant. In that situation, it would become a taxable property according to an assessor. Historically speaking, how did the library start? Didn't it go through taxing entity or, if I recall? It's actually city property. Okay. At one time. Yeah. So, <laughs> funny, you should, funny you should ask. Yes. Um, because we had that conversation today, and I'm trying to pull up. The, um, the corporation, the something corporation. Yeah. So... In essence, the piece of property, um, from what we gather, was owned by the Victoria Development Corporation. Correct. Which, as you know, is a quasi-city you know, city entity. From what we gather, based off of the deed document, is that that was conveyed to the county for $10 um, in, I think, 1972 time frame. Uh, what we know, though, on some other things that were going on around the same time, um, was, of course, the beginning of a, of a uh, complex relationship between the city and the county for running of the facility, right? And I'm not going to run you through the history of the different arrangements and, and whatnot, but ultimately the thing that I think is relevant is, is that element, which is that it was owned by the Victoria Development Corporation and then conveyed to the county for the $10 at the time, which I assume the Development Corporation did it, you know, not trying to, um, you know, get uh, market you know, value for the piece of property, because what the county ended up doing was that there was a county election um, in December on December 9, 1972, that authorized the issuance of $1.25 million worth of bonds for purpose of constructing and equipping a, pu equipping a public library um, on land which the county had acquired. Um, and so that's what was taking place in 1972. You know, the county builds the facility. Um, now looking back, right, we think of $1.25 million and we're like, <laughs> wow, you know, um, I wish we could build a library for for, for that amount. Mm -hmm. But since then, um, you know, it's been a county uh, owned library. They did pay for it. Technically, all of the county residents, right, agreed to pay for that. Uh, and it's just been this um, relationship, city county, to run the facility. It's gone from the county le legitimately cutting a check to the library to help fund the operations to where we are now, where we don't receive direct cash from the county to run this library. Um, the library's operational and maintenance budget is 100% city of Victoria. Um, and the agreement that we're working under now, as you may recall, is a complicated agreement that hits on a variety of different functions, EMS, animal control, and library. And so what started this conversation last year was an effort on our part to try and clean some of that up because these agreements are old, they're confusing, um, and we are in alignment with the county judge and the county to update these agreements. And as part of those conversations, we've had these ideas around um, how we can invest more into the library. Uh, council did approve the library master plan that we process that we went through over the last year, which as you learn, you know, conveyed to us that for a community of our size, the library ought to be twice the square footage size than it is now. Um, and so at the time, right, in 1972 and in 1970, a uh, few years later when it opened, it was ahead of its time in terms of its size, but there hasn't been any major addition since then. And we know that we want to obviously enhance livability, right? It's what we do. And consequently, we felt it was appropriate to find a way to take better ownership of the facility if we're going to embark on this journey to invest uh, millions of dollars into the facility over time, obviously. Um, and again, we're fully... Uh, already funding the operation and the maintenance of um, the facility. And so for us, it just made sense to explore um, the option. But of course, ultimately, it's up to you and county commissioners on on it. 
but that's a little bit more background on how it all developed and where we are now. Thank you. And, and I'll interject one last one last thing on the appraisals. Obviously, there's two appraisals floating around that we've, we've established. Obviously, I, I always find in my interest, it's always best to try to accomplish two approaches to value anytime you're looking at a property. The cost approach gives you a really good understanding of the base value in a property, especially when there's feel, such little data. So having established a land value and having known costs to construct and then having actual income and rental rates within the community <coughs> and also outside the region for government properties, I think the value is again well supported. I will say that my counterpart used one approach, um, sales only of properties located throughout the state. So I feel very confident about my appraisal and uh, I really appreciate your time allowing me to speak this evening. So, so you're saying you like yours better? <laughs> I, I feel very good about my appraisal and what's, what's inside it. So. Well, I know this is a difficult presentation, but it would be much harder if you had to say you like the other one better. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. So, thank we you would, very much. We wouldn't hire him again. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Weatherby, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, one of the things that's also important and relevant as part of this conversation, and I'll use this as a segue to introduce our second city manager's report, is that there's also been some chatter around not only what we want to do to the building in the future, but around what are some of the issues that the building has now. Uh, and um, to that end, we embarked on this journey to do a facility master plan for all of our facilities. Um, I will... I'm not going to steal any of Derek's thunder, but I'll simply convey that the appraisals, both the cities and the counties, uh, do not take into account um, any of the results of the facility master plan or the or the condition facility condition assessment that you're about to hear tonight. And so, our challenge that we'll discuss more in executive session, and I'm sure in the weeks and months ahead, is how we marry the appraisals that have been done with the master plan that was adopted a couple months ago, and then also with the facility condition assessment that you're going to learn more about tonight. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Derek uh, to further introduce the topic. I got to just get back down. I'm more Mike's height. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Farrell. Good evening, Mayor, Pro Tem and Council. I'm going to adjust for the nice Pro save. Tem too. Thanks. Um, as Jesus said, uh, we did, as part of a facilities master plan, phase one was a facilities condition assessment done through uh, Brian Mead with FGM Architects, and they worked with Bureau Veritas. Uh, in a moment, you'll hear from Andrew Huff and Brian Mead both on sort of the process of that. Uh, they, we did review 28 facilities. Uh, after Brian and Andrew get to kind of go through the overview of what they did and what all the things they took into account and in looking at the condition of these facilities, you'll also hear from <laughs> Roger Welder on how our city staff uses that, that condition assessment um, and a database that we maintain uh, that, that helps us know the direction we need to follow on all of our facilities and, and what things are, uh, are there along with their cost estimates. So when we're building our budgets, we're prepared for that. So before I turn it over to, uh, to Brian and to Andrew, did I leave anything out? Do you have any questions for me? No, go ahead. Good. They're on virtually, and so we'll pop them up <clears throat> somehow. At least I hope they're still on. Yes, good, good evening. evening. Good evening. There you are. So I'll start with a quick introduction and then uh, Andrew, do you have the PowerPoint to share or does the city have it or do you want me to share? Uh, Brian, I have it. You have it. Okay, great. Well. Andrew, uh, as, as Derek said with the introductions, uh, will do most of the presentation of the slides since he led that part of phase one. Um, and I'm, I'm here obviously uh, as the architect to support uh, any questions that come up uh, as well today. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Andy for the uh, brief presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening. So I'm gonna share my screen here and all right, can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Perfect. All right. So uh, as Brian and Derek mentioned, we were engaged to perform a facility condition assessment. And 
Yeah, we'll start with a little bit of an introduction to Bureau Veritas for those of you who are not familiar with, with us. Talk a little bit about the scope, our key findings, the summary of the data, and then you know I'll be able to answer any questions, hopefully, that you guys might have. So if you are not familiar, Bureau Veritas is a large international building assessment and inspection company. So we have about 750 employees across North America. A large concentration of those were in Texas. So we used you know, the majority of our, our regional team there to uh, perform these assessments. Um, we've completed well over you know, 50,000 projects over the past 10 years. So a little bit about the physical needs assessment itself. So what we did is we sent our architects and engineers out in the field with our iPad, iPads to gather information about every building. So we are taking photos, we are capturing uh, every asset that's associated with that building required to run that building or keep it operational. We did not look at any FF and E or anything that was not necessary to uh, the functionality of the building. We look at it as kind of if the current tenant moved out, what would, what would it take to keep that building functional? So the iPads, they're uh, organized in a way that it keeps all of our architects and engineers uh, collecting data in a very consistent, concise method. So everybody's using the same uh, fields, gathering make, model, serial number of all um, MEP equipment, uh, taking photos, capturing quantities, conditions, when it was installed, all of that information. So the other nice thing about, about the app is it has some QC functionality built into it just to ensure that everybody's looking at things the same. So for every single asset, when they're looking at something, they can pull up pictures of roofs to help them understand where this roof might be in its life cycle. Or if we're looking at something very unique, it will help them identify what that piece of equipment is right there in the field. So our assessment included everything from the site and the infrastructure, where we're looking at parking lots, sidewalks, um, you know, charging stations, anything on that to the underground, um, plumbing, electrical, gas lines, to um, the building exterior and the envelope, where we are capturing the building the facade itself, windows, doors, flashing, caulking, roofs to rooftop systems, not just the roof itself, but all MEP items on the roof, uh, flashings, parapets, any roof mounted equipment, um, those were all included to the interiors. Everything from the condition of the paint on the walls to the carpet on the flooring, everything in between, excluding the FF and E. Uh, and finally, mechanical electrical plumbing systems, where we're looking at all major MEP items, gathering make, model, serial number, fire protection systems, any vertical transportation, all of those things were included in this assessment. So really what that does is that allows us to compile all this data, and we're able to organize that data by building, but then also look at it portfolio-wide. So for the city of Victoria, we identified... Uh, about $682,000 worth of life safety items. Those are usually like trip hazards. Um, that's usually the biggest one, any uh, displacement of sidewalk. They're anything that could present an injury or runs a, uh, of the risk of injury to any party who is um, utilizing that space. We identified about you know, $5.6 million of performance <laughs> integrity items. Those are things that are not functioning the way they are intended. It could be that the equipment has failed or it's almost failing. Like, for example, an air handler that breaks down every Tuesday and is obsolete and you're having trouble getting parts. That would be something that would be identified as a performance integrity item. We identified about $350,000 worth of ADA items. $36,000 worth of environmental items. So those are... Uh, air or, or water quality issues. It could be any suspect uh, moisture or mildew issues. Those things are environmental concerns. Retrofit adaptation. Those are things that need to be upgraded just to meet uh, current standards, whether that's um, code or you know city standards. Like you know, for example, if you guys had decided that you only wanted to use LV LV um, luxury vinyl plank flooring in public buildings instead of uh, vinyl tile, you know, that would be an example of a, a retrofit or adaptation. But finally, life cycle renewal. 
So over the next 10 years, we've identified about 20, almost $29 million worth of uh, assets that will need to be replaced because they will be at the end of their useful life sometime over the next 10 years. So that's a little bit of the breakdown of the costs that we've identified. But if we come in here, you can just kind of see at a glance where those costs fall over the next 20 years. You know, so immediately we have about you know, a little over $5 million worth of work over the next 20 years. Now we're looking a little bit further out. We've identified over $100 million worth of, uh, of work that would need to be done at the facilities across your portfolio. So some of the immediate needs just by by building, um, you can see here, this is the total of them, a little over $5 million. Uh, the public library has the largest uh, amount of immediate needs uh, dollar-wise, uh, followed by the community center. Uh, so those, you know, all of these totals comprise that, that $5.1 million. Immediate needs, those are things that are, would need to be addressed within the next 12 months. So finally, you know, we have all this information. So how is it important or how is it usable to you guys? Well, so we can take that and we can create a facility condition index. So that's taking the projected replacement value of the building over the needs that we've identified over a given period of time. So for example, you can see here three years out, the darker the color, the worse condition the building is. This is assuming that there's no major um, improvements done to the facilities. There's not a major influx of cash associated or, or um, allocated to these buildings. So, you know, three years out, you have several buildings in the orange. These are subjected to hard or long-term wear nearing the end of their serviceable life. By 10 years out, if there's not major investment in these buildings, you can see here that we have, you know, more than a half a dozen of buildings that have will have then reached the end of their useful lives. Buildings that at that point it will no longer be viable to invest in the in the buildings. So if you think about it in terms of like an automobile, you know, if you need to replace the tires, the windshield, uh, that you're having transmission problems, at what point are you better off just buying a new car? That's the decision you have to make on these buildings in the red 10 years out if there's not investment in the buildings. So for every building, we did a full comprehensive report. We are showing every asset that will need to be replaced over the next 20 years, when that asset will need to be replaced and approximately how much that will, that will cost to replace it. So all of those reports uh, have been delivered to you guys. You know, and finally, what that does is, you know, it allows you to use this, this data in a variety of ways. You know, you're able to take it and really figure out what priorities do you have, what your needs are over the next one, two, three, five, 10, 20 years, and, and ultimately develop a, a capital plan to address those. So that's really what we did in a nutshell. So I'm going to stop here to see what sort of questions you guys might have about any of this. I'll simply add that you're probably thinking, how are we using this information? And Roger will go through that here in a minute. Um, but, uh, but this specific slide that's up now I think is relevant because it showcases and in essence proves that some of the conversations that we've been having um, are warranted. So as an example, some of the buildings that are in red are buildings that we're already talking about doing something with. So like the relocation of Station 5, for example, that's red, right? The fire administration building is going to be red, which would be obsolete once we build the public safety headquarter building. You know, the building City Hall, right, which we know that the complex we're in now would come after everybody moves out of here to public safety and it starts that snowball effect. Um, and so for us, that's why this type of information is relevant. Um, it's relevant to have an outside third party expert firm to come in and help us do this to facilitate and help us have these conversations, um, because, as you know, Oftentimes, our own facilities um, may not rise to the level of a priority to the general public because uh, the general public, of course, you know, has more pressing items to prioritize like streets, <coughs> sidewalks, public safety, you know, et cetera. But these facilities are important. 
uh, for our employees, and they have a direct role in our ability to uh, provide uh, great customer service uh, to the public and great services, and so that's why it's important. So I think this page, this slide specifically validates a lot of the conversations we've been having about some of these buildings. So is, is the idea to take this information and use that to kind of prioritize, not yeah. just based on red or yellow, but based on, you know, w which one of these would be more important to the city function, which one would be more important to uh, services provided, Correct. that sort of thing? A hundred percent, right? Okay. And so for some historical context, so um, four <laughs> years ago, um, uh, I hate to say, I hate to word it this way, but four years ago when I, when, when I arrived um, and we were looking at assessing um, the organization, there was a, a definite uh, area of opportunity when it came to building maintenance. Um, and so one of the first reorgs that this administration did was create the building and equipment services department because prior to there really wasn't somebody that full time or a department full time that could really focus on us being proactive with this, right? Um, there are some folks that believe that, you know, don't fix something until it breaks. Well, okay, but that's not really efficient because at that point it might cost you more money. And if it has a negative impact on our ability to provide the services that we provide, which are very critical in my opinion, all of them, not just police and fire, um, then it's important to be more proactive. And so we created the Building and Equipment Services Department. Um, Roger um, was elevated to become uh, technically the first director of that department. And since then, we've been taking baby steps and being more proactive with our building maintenance from custodial services all the way to the HVAC replacement <coughs> program um, that this study helps facilitate. And so it might be beneficial to just naturally segue into um, Roger's presentation unless you have specific questions. I'm sure they'll stay on, but. I have a question. I, I'm, a specific, I'm just bothered by this chart because while it makes perfect sense, it doesn't make sense uh, on the left side, it's got the FCI ranges in description. On the right side, it's got numbers, but the FCI ranges in descriptions, uh, the yellow is 10 to 60, the pink or red is 60 and above, and yet in the 10-year column, anything over 30 seems to be red. And, and a, the 10 to 60 seems to, so basically everything that's red should be yellow if you follow the chart. And that's bugging me. I can, I can understand what you're trying to tell me, but you're, you're not giving me data that's really telling me that. So what am I not seeing? So that, that's, that's a, great, a great catch. I, I didn't see that uh, here up front. When we were putting this presentation together, there are different charts to, that we, we use. And for years, this is the data. I need to adjust these to reflect that. So this, this is... Uh, it should be 10 to 30 and then 30 and above. So that's how we ended up organizing your data. And that, that's helpful too because 30 doesn't sound quite as scary. So even though you're trying to give me that information, 30 is not near as scary as 60 in terms of danger or whatever. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Did we not spend a bunch of money on fire station number one? Yes, uh, but this was completed before that. Okay. So when they showed up with the right pads to walk the facility uh, <coughs> was before that. And so that, again, also showcases that we were being proactive and timely with the remodel of that, um, of that building. Because this technically was completed um, in the fall? I feel like it was summer um, last year. Yeah, yeah. We, we, were, we were on site March and April of 2022. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we were live in the database in June. Right. And it's taken us a while because the facility master plan overall had three phases. It had this phase, the facility condition assessment. It had a spatial analysis phase, which has also for the most part been completed in terms of meetings, meaning Brian and his team came in and spoke with everybody to learn about what their projections are for growth to help us figure out how much space we need. Um, and that's why the conversation around how over the last 20, 25 years, the city has had 700 main to grow into, but we don't have anywhere else to grow into over the next 20, 25 years. Um, so that is relevant. And then the third element of the facility master plan is the actual master planning element of it. Um, but that effort has been delayed because Brian Mead and FGMA are also the lead architects in the design for the public safety headquarter building. And so doing the design for the public safety headquarter building has taken priority. Uh, for Brian and his team. 
Uh, so we were kind of waiting to present phase one results until we had all phases complete, but then it was timely for us to start sharing with you some information, specifically because of the overlap that, um, we're not the overlap, but the relevancy of specifically the library um, assessment and the ongoing conversation about its value. Yeah, so good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Mr. Welder, good to see you. It's good to see you all too, it's been a while. Um, so uh, real quick, I only have a couple of slides, but um, just uh, from our perspective, what this does for us as far as uses, um, we can we can plan more easily, more effectively, we can budget much more effectively, and, and then of course track life cycles and um, our completed work with using this database. So um, it's easy to organize in the planning phases, it's easy to organize by, by facility, it's easy to organize by um, type of equipment, um, Whatever you whatever you're looking at at that moment, say if we're just budgeting for HVAC, if we're budgeting for electrical, mechanical, plumbing, whatever we're trying to do, we can isolate all those assets out of the database and create individual budgets for those type of systems. As well as if we want to look at just a specific building, we're able to break it down that way as well. So I'll show you another slide in a second that's got what the database looks like for one facility for just a, a small portion of it, but. Uh, as far as budgeting assistance, um, one of the things we really struggled with as a new department and as someone new to construction and facilities management um, was just how do you estimate costs for replacements of, of um, large items, uh, large commercial HVAC units, as well as doing remodels of spaces and changing um, flooring finishings and, and all things like that. So. In the background of the asset calc database that we use from Bureau of Veritas uh, is running a program called RS Means, which is a cost estimation database um, that's available for purchase to, to people who uh, do construction for a living. But um, it runs in the background, and so it applies a budgetary replacement cost or repair cost to any item in that database that we may need to look at. Um, it's also escalated. Um, for <clears throat> in, uh, inflation, about 8%, 8.3, I think he had on his presentation. But um, it adjusts annually for that uh, inflation as well. So they've got, I think RS Means has 92,000 line items is what they claim, um, all with prices including material, labor, um, and equipment used for making those repairs or replacing that equipment. And tracking asset life cycles, it's a huge help for that. Like I said, you can isolate those groups and, and organize them in a fashion that shows you the oldest uh, or most problematic equipment that you have in a hurry, just very quick. Um, and we're also, we can go in and change those assets. When we do replace an air conditioning unit or a water heater, we can go in and enter a new make model serial number and it deletes the old item, inserts a new item and starts the life cycle over again. So very useful. Uh, this slide shows what our database looks like. This particular picture is just a screenshot. It's from the library's um, page. It's organized by um, the time that you can see that the, uh, the little red dots where it's, they all say 2023. Um, these are the most immediate needs that the library has. Um, I've got another spreadsheet on another slide, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You're able to click on each line item, go and you can see pictures all of the pictures that they took, you can see the status, um, whether it's good, fair, or poor, uh, how much it's gonna cost to fix or replace it, and what when you should do that. Um, so uh, as for relevant conversation to um, Mr. Atien's report earlier in the library, these are the things that were identified from the first three years of the library um, that were kind of in need of immediate attention. Uh, there's, there's quite a few things here, um, totaling $2.25 million um, at, for just to have the building running like it's meant to run. Um, some different things uh, we have done already. So the, the first thing you see is a storefront glazing framing windows. We did do that grant funded um, security film with new glazing on the windows, which took <clears throat> care of a large portion of that. It did not address the glazing on the outside of the windows and the window frames, but the inside is sealed and taken care of with that uh, 
bullet not bullet resistant but missile resistant what what have you um you know yeah it's not, it's not bullet but it's, it's missile, missile resistant, resistant. <laughs> yeah. you know the flying two by four test you know that yeah. thing that's that that's not what i think when anyway. you say the word missile though missile yeah we're uh, all gonna go to the library you, know? so you mean projectile <laughs> projectile that's what i'm looking for yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you projectile. Um, i think you got so, a new nickname watch yeah watch that watch that guy so there's, uh, yeah, lots of things here you can see. Um, as far as even an, uh, reconfiguring, completely reconfiguring an ADA restroom. Um, engineering studies on um, the sanitary sewer system. Um, there's a, the, uh, a line item here, I think, to um, replace the um, kind of the entire electrical system. And I think that's really pointing at, like, uh, the wall receptacles and different things that, are, that seem to be kind of out of date and may not be grounded, things like that. Um, so um, this is kind of a, a total three-year look at the library and what it needs. Um, so that's pretty much all I had there. Um, I'll, I'll only add that this is very, very relevant to the conversation around the value of the library building because the um, appraisal, as I mentioned, neither appraisal takes into account um, this 2.2 million. The appraisal done, presented to the county did account for $100,000 of um, some improvements needed at the library. I, I can't tell you, you know, who conveyed to them that it only needed $100,000 or what third-party company they, they hired to review the building to the extent that we have. Um, but certainly the $2.2 million that you see in front of you are for sure not in either appraisal, and that's one of the main objectives of presenting this to you tonight. Um, and just uh, if if you wanted to see the database, we do have it pulled up on James's computer, and I can kind of <clears> navigate <throat> around if if you'd like to kind of see how it works. But other than that, I'm I'm pretty much finished. I'm just looking at the low hanging fruit. Can we replace the four hundred dollars worth of sheetrock from last year and the trash receptacle <laughs> for this year, and then we'll be current? For yes, this year. yes. Some of those, especially like uh, like Mr. Hupp was mentioning, the safety uh, related items, um, the stuff that's been um, that's not been too costly, that's been easily uh, addressed. We have um, addressed most of those things. So um, yes, we will definitely <laughs> hit the low hanging fruit on the library. Well, in any building, for that matter, yeah, definitely, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. That's all. All the buildings we've we've started to address those things. It's good information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Missile Welder? I mean, Mr. Welder. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> uh, I think we still have uh, Andy and Brian on online. In case you have any questions for them. Good for me. Good. Anybody? No. Okay. In case you are, in case you are wondering, we don't have a physical written report of all the facilities when we signed off on the um, agreement, if you will. Um, we opted to not pay the thirteen thousand dollars that it would have cost us to produce that written report. We instead simply accepted the information in the form of the database because that's what is useful. Um, so if you're wondering, like, why didn't I get a binder this thick, you know, with everything? Um, we didn't think it was it was worth it to have it that way. I'm not wondering. I'm saying thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we okay. do want to read that whole thing. <laughs> By Friday, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So then we'll move on, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if that's all right, uh, to our third and final city manager's report, which is the CDBG 2023 Annual Action Plan Proposed Budget and Funding Recommendation. And Julie will take this item. Evening again. So it's Evening, that time Ms. of year. How are you? Doing well. So as you know, every June we um, give you a proposed budget on uh, for CDBG funds. Um, get, hope, hope to get y'all's blessing tonight. And then we spend all summer writing our annual action plan, come back in August, ask for y'all's formal approval and adoption of that plan, and then we submit it to HUD so that um, beginning October 1st, we are ready to go and spend those funds. So um, today I'm, like I said, presenting the 2023 annual action plan uh, proposed funding recommendations, which corresponds with fiscal year 2024. That can be a bit confusing that the years are different. So our entitlement funds that we're receiving this year are 566,898 
dollars, which is about 10,000 less than what we received last year. Um, but we do have some unallocated funds. As you know, that our, our annual action plan um, corresponds with our five-year consolidated plans. And so we are in, um, I, I believe we're going to go into year three of our consolidated plan, uh, we're finishing year three of our, so we're at the point where we're starting to see um, some programs close out and have some savings in our different programs. So we have some unallocated funds that we are um, also going to be asking to, are making a recommendation on reprogramming. So our entitlement funding this year was 566,000. From our 2020 to 2024 consolidated plan, um, we have 113,000 of unallocated funds. And then from our 2015 to 2019 consolidated plan, we have 85,000 in unallocated funds, which brings us to a total of $765,954 that we are going to be asking to budget um, in August with our annual action plan and amendments. So with our um, budget this next year, we're proposing our administration, which of course pays um, for salaries and office space, and that's capped at 20% of the entitlement. Um, an affordable housing program, our mortgage and down payment and closing cost assistance, which is a program um, we just brought back um, at 20,000. Owner-occupied owner rehab, um, which we were par partnering with Habitat, but um, due to their capacity issues, we're going to be taking that completely on and doing that ourselves. Um, we're proposing $113,963.36. Um, demolition, which is, of course, a, a long-held program that we have that helps um, demo properties that are eligible at 85000 And then um, we'll have a list of the public facilities and public services. Uh, and you can see that matches. And I've color coded. The red color um, comes from our entitlement funds. The blue is our 2020 to 2024 unallocated funds that we're reprogramming. And then the green is our 2015, 2019 um, unprogrammed funds that we are reprogramming to demolition. I hope that's all clear. Any questions on the overall budget? Can I ask about on the uh, mortgage down payment? You said that we <laughs> had that before. And so we just brought it, it back it last. Back. Yeah, we just brought it back last year. We okay. only um, funded enough for one, and we met that goal. And so uh, we're seeing a little bit more um, interest in it. It's it's a kind of a hard program because you almost need a unicorn because you have to have low enough income to qualify, but high enough credit scores to be eligible for a mortgage. Um, so we are hopefully we'll um, be able to help two people in this next fiscal year. Okay. Good. Thanks. But it was a program that we, we did a long time ago for many years. Julie, if we allocate all of that money this year, the seven hundred and sixty-five, sixty-six thousand, 66,000, and we will probably only receive, I imagine it'll go down as it seems like our entitlement funds continue to drop through the years. It, I mean, if we utilize a, this, we're going to be, it's going to be essentially a 200,000 drop next year, correct? Well, no, this, these, um, the additional funds, the 113 and 85, those are previous entitlement sure. funds that we had programmed, and for whatever reason, the, the projects come under budget. So we still, you have a time frame to spend the, the funding, so we still need to reallocate it and spend it, especially those 2015 to 2019 um, funds. So um, you'll It'll see just us be a hickey, though, having this much money. We kind of have a bonus pot th this year if it's spent. But then it'll be lo lower next year. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm saying we kind of have a bonus pot. Yes, yes. This year of essentially two hundred thousand, right? That right. we won't yes. have next that year. That we won't have no. next year. So just that's just for us to be prepared up here. Right. Yes, very much so. Our, we're we can just really expect that a half a million dollars, and I don't think expect substantially less or substantially more. We've been pretty flat at that. It, it may vary from five twenty five to five seventy five, or you know somewhere in there, but it's roughly half a million dollars that we should expect every year. So this is our um, the, the income limits that HUD uh, published, and they will go into effect um, June 15th. So it's just um, an important reminder for you all that all of these funds have to help low to moderate income individuals. And so this is what that looks like. Um, you've got the different income levels, the 30%, 50%, 80%. And of course, it's a sliding scale based on how many folks are in your home. So our 2023 public facility recommendation is um, 25,000 to the Boys and Girls Club for a technology center room, uh, 195,000 to Mid Coast Family Services for a day center, 72,500 to Meals on Wheels uh, to build a real rear parking lot, 
$40,000 to Victoria Christian Assistance Ministry VCAM um, to uh, build in a, a metal building of clothing donation sorting area. And then $18,000 to the YMCA for renovation of a child care uh, center room. And that uh, totals $350,500. Can you, can you uh, address the, the day center with Midco's versus the day center that we have heard about earlier with the Salvation Army? So the day center with Salvation Army is a little bit more robust in that they're going to have some programming, um, you know, life skills training, those sorts of activities. And the day center with Midco's is going to focus really on being a respite area, you know, computers, showers, laundry facilities. Um, and, and honestly, our community is, um, has enough need for both. Um, I actually, when we were doing this, we still had um, estimated numbers to the population served. But we had 225 total sh um, homeless folks in our last point in time count, and 177 of those were unsheltered. Um, and as um, Captain Jones mentioned, you know, it's not necessarily just homeless folks that are going to be eligible to use these day centers. Um, and so they're similar, but they also have some differences to them. And, and really, we just have a need. There are, you know, both, both there's a capacity for both. Um, Thank you facilities. So this is our um, recommended public service activity funding. Now this funding, as you know, is capped at 15%. This is the funding that is very hard to allocate because everybody could use every bit of funds. Um, this is the funding that's, that runs the programs year over year um, and is, is just so vital um, to these different activities. But of course, HUD does cap it at 15%. So our max funding this year to allocate out was $85,034, and we're proposing to allocate, of course, $85,000. So um, we have a new one on the list this year, Billy T. Catan, um, for their Office Behavioral Interventions Program, their office on Crestwood. Um, we're proposing $10,000. Boys and Girls Club of Victoria, their summer camp and after school camp at 10,000. Community Action Committee Home Delivered Meal Program, we're recommending 8,000. Uh, their Community Action Committee, uh, their Senior Care Services Program is also 8,000. Golden Crescent CASA at 8,000. Um, Food Bank of the Golden Crescent Kids Weekend Meal Program, or their backpack program is 12,000. <coughs> Gulf Bend Center Wellness Community um, helps with staffing at 15,000. Meals on Wheels Home Delivered Meal Program at 6,000, and then United Way of the Crossroads Community Connections Project at 8,000, and that totals um, 85,000. And you can see the amount requested was 158,000. So this is the this is the really hard part of whenever we're doing our allocations because we wish we could you know give everyone the full amount that they requested. <clears throat> Are there any questions on our public service activity recommendations? Oh. So this summer, we will be busy. Really, our great team, Zach Wendell and Celeste Menchaca, um, with very little proofreading help from me, will be busy writing our annual action plan and, and the consolidated plan amendments um, over the summer. And then in um, public uh, hearing, or public comment period will open um, in, on June 30th and really basically run the month of July. And at the August 1st, 2023 council meeting, we will ask for your formal approval and then submit to HUD on or before August 16th, which is the statutory deadline to submit. And that's all I have tonight, unless there's any questions. Yep. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Julie, do you normally get any changes once you have your public hearings, or do they pretty much stay the same that y'all budgeted? Um, we don't really receive a lot um, of public comment. We, um, what's part of this process and what's ongoing right now too is um, a community survey where we reach out to all of the providers and they're providing that, that input. Um, and then of course we have a, a mandatory um, meeting in March for them to even apply. You have to attend the meeting to apply. And so um, there's a lot of work that goes in before the funding recommendations to make sure that everyone is really on board um, and and with how the money, uh, we're, uh, with the recommendations that we're going to be making to y'all when it comes to all the providers. So chances are the way you presented it tonight is the way you're going to mm -hmm. present it in August? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right. We do have an executive session. Yes. Correct. Yes. 
The City Council will recess for executive session on the 6th day of June 2023 at 7.08 p.m. The subject matter executive session deliberation is as follows. Texas Ex Government Code 551.087, Texas Government Code 551.072, and Texas Government Code 551.071. All right, meeting adjourned. Adjourned. Oh. Recess.